Sudan says it's killed the leader of the region's most powerful rebel group. Khalil Ibrahim headed the justice and equality movement, which has sworn to topple the Khartoum government. What impact will his death have on rebel forces in Sudan and on the ongoing attempts to secure peace in Darfur? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. Darfur's most powerful rebel group, the Justice and Equality Movement, has suffered a serious blow. Sudan's army spokesman announced the death of Khalil Ibrahim, the head of the movement better known as JEM. The spokesman says Ibrahim was killed in fighting with Sudanese troops in the Wad Banda area of North Kordofan while trying to cross the border into South Sudan. From Khartoum, Mohamed Val sheds more light on the man and the significance of his death. Khalil Ibrahim was considered one of Khartoum's most powerful opponents in Darfur. Now the Sudanese army say they've hunted him down. The Sudanese army managed in the early hours of today to kill the rebel Khalil Ibrahim in the state of North Kurdfan. He was trying to infiltrate the state of South Sudan to regroup his troops there. But our troops surrounded him in the local area. He entered that area yesterday and attacked civilians and killed some of them, kidnapping some women and children. Our troops rushed to the area and surrounded the rebel groups and killed some of them with their leader, Khalil Ibrahim. Ibrahim was behind the two main attacks that defined the Darfur conflict. The attack on Al-Fashr airport in 2003, in which a number of Sudanese military aircraft were destroyed, setting off the beginning of the conflict. The second was his attack on the Sudanese capital in 2008. This is the city of Omdurman, just across the river from Khartoum. In 2008, Khalil Ibrahim's heavily armed militias reached this point, trying to march on the presidential palace, which is only about five kilometers from here, before they were crushed by the Sudanese army. Ibrahim's declared policy was the complete overthrow of the Sudanese government as the only way to end the struggle in Darfur. For several years, he refused to negotiate. And when he finally signed a few deals with Khartoum, he soon backed down. He was supported by part of the Zagawa tribe he belonged to, and also, allegedly, by the Islamist movement led by Hassan Turabi. But Ibrahim's main support came from neighboring Chad and Libya, where he found refuge. After Libyans overthrew Muammar Gaddafi, Ibrahim sneaked back into Sudan. Most of the justice and equality movement commanders were killed during the fighting in Libya, and that has weakened them. And the biggest aftermath of Gaddafi's fall is this relative calm that we see in Darfur. Now, with Ibrahim killed, the Sudanese say they hope a negotiated solution in Darfur could be more likely than ever before. Mohamed Val for Inside Story, Khartoum. Khalil Ibrahim founded the Justice and Equality Movement in 2001. A member of the Al Zagawa tribe, which is dominant in Chad, but a minority in the Darfur region, Ibrahim at one stage served in the government of Sudanese President Omar al Bashir. But al Bashir became a sworn enemy, and with the aim of unseating him, Khalil Ibrahim built the Justice and Equality Movement, or JEM, into what many observers describe as the most significant force in the region with as many as 35,000 well-armed fighters. The JEM's main targets are Sudanese security forces and the irregular Janjaweed militias, which it insists are a proxy force of the al-Bashir government. The movement utilizes small arms in its operations, mainly rocket-propelled grenades, assault and bolt-action rifles, and some anti-aircraft weapons. In the past, it's believed to have received financial and logistical support from Chad and from expatriates around the world. In 2008, the movement launched an unprecedented assault on the capital Khartoum, the attack repulsed on the outskirts of the city by Sudan's military. It refused to become part of the alliance of Sudanese resistance groups, the Liberation and Justice Movement, or LJM, and declined to sign a peace agreement between the LJM and Sudan, which was brokered in Qatar in 2010. But last month, the Justice and Equality Movement formed an alliance with three other resistance groups, 
calling for unity among Sudan's opposition forces to bring about regime change. Well, will the killing of Khalil Ibrahim help or hinder long-standing attempts to broker a lasting peace in the troubled region of Darfur? To discuss these issues, we're joined by our guests. In Khartoum, Hafiz Mohammed. He's the director of Justice Africa Sudan. In London, Ishag Meki, a Darfurian activist and secretary general of the Darfurian Victims Organization for Rehabilitation and Relief. And also in Khartoum, Rabid Abdul Ati, a prominent leader within the governing party of Sudan, the National Congress Party, and an advisor to the Ministry of Information. Welcome to you all. Let's begin in Khartoum with Rabi Abdul Ati. What is your reaction to the death of Khalil Ibrahim? Yes, uh, the death of uh, Khalil Ibrahim representing a new phase uh, uh, in Sudan, whereas Sudan government signed the document of peace in Doha, and uh, numbers of uh, groups now agreed uh, to, for, to join the government, and now there is a broad base government, and Darfurians now that are contributing in this broad-based government, and I think that the death of Khalil Ibrahim will represent uh, the achievement of peace and the actually uh, the consent of Darfurians to actually continue this uh, uh, movement of peace and I, I think that the death also of Khalil Ibrahim will represent uh, the closing of the file of war between the government and the rebels. Well, Ishak Meghi in London, what's your view? Uh, well, I think uh, the death of uh, leader Khalil Ibrahim is a tragic uh, event and uh, I think people of Darfur have uh, gathered together and hold these uh, genuine grievances towards the uh, government of uh, Khartoum. And it is a tragic event, I would say, but uh, I would say that the, this is not uh, conclude uh, the struggle uh, in, in Darfur, uh, because people do believe that there, there were a genuine grievances that haven't been addressed yet with the government of Sudan. And I believe the justice and equality movement, they will appoint a new leader, they will gather themselves, and there's other two, I think, two big groups in uh, Darfur area is acting and fighting again there. So I don't think its uh, chapter has been closed, but I think it is uh, for the good benefit of Sudan government to sit down and address the genuine uh, grievances of these uh, armed leaders uh, and, the, and fighters of, of Darfur. Well, so Hafez, I, I, I think... Hafez Mohammed, um, we've got two contrasting views there. Uh, yes. What's your opinion on the death? I think um, uh, there's two uh, uh, issues here. One is the impact of the death of Khalil Ibrahim on justice and equality movement in terms of leadership. He's a charismatic leader, he's a fighter, and he used to actually uh, dominate uh, everything within the movement in terms of politics and military. His death, I think, in the short run, might make uh, a big, uh, uh, a significant impact on the movement. But it depends on how the leadership of the movement is going to react to that and also and how are they going to keep the movement intact. I think that is one thing. The other thing with regard to the peace process, I think the, issue, the problem is more deeper than just killing of Khalil Ibrahim. Because um, uh, in 2006, when Abuja agreement was being signed, uh, justice and equality was uh, we, the weakest movement. And uh, uh, Minima Nawi SPLA, S SPLA is the, the strongest one. And things have changed since that. But I think what we need is uh, Doha uh, peace document is a good step forward towards the peace. But to be, for it to succeed, it needs a complementary measure, which includes an non-signatory, and that includes Abdul Wahid. And, and also Minim and Nawi, and also I think uh, just just the death of Khalil will not actually uh, automatically bring peace. I think there is more uh, need to be done with regard to uh, addressing the issues, the underlying causes of the rebel movement, whether it is in Darfur, whether in Kurdufan, whether in Blue Nile. There is underlying causes of uh, center periphery problems marginalization need to be addressed. I think if that addressed, then we will have peace. But uh, I think in the long run, it might have uh, significant, but in the short terms, uh, I don't know how things, I think we have to wait and see how things is going to develop. Well, Ishak Meki in London, we are talking about one man, a leader, a very powerful and charismatic leader, as has been said. 
but already clear in the conversation the question of unity among those who want to achieve a peace settlement in Darfur. Has the killing of uh, this particular man highlighted once again the divisions uh, among the opposition groups in Sudan? Yes, I do agree with uh, uh, they say that uh, the lack of unity in, among the Darfur rebels, that's really the, the main problem that they faced and they will, it will remain an issue. But uh, the, the people who we, we uh, campaign for the uh, peace and stability in Darfur and Kurdistan and all of Sudan, we always invite those rebel group and leaders to sit down and put everything uh, all the differences behind at the moment and they have to group and unite and stick together and face up the Sudan government in Khartoum there. After they winning the battle then they have to come back to see what are the differences among them. But uh, it, it looks that this uh, topic is uh, not uh, nearly to be achieved. They still, uh, I think re recently they have uh, formed uh, a coalition called uh, Kauda, which is uh, the main three groups, Minibunawi, Abdul Wahid, and Dr. Khalil. Uh, I think if they uh, stick together and they uh, comply with the, what they have agreed and, 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 and stay and remain in one camp against the government of Sudan, I think even in terms of negotiation or fighting, they can get somewhere. But this is, has been an issue for a long, long time. The rebel groups have been divided and divided and divided, and that's really not helped. I think uh, for, for the leader of Khalil Ibrahim, I think he is a significant uh, leader. He is the only fighter or rebel leader who able to reach Khartoum once. I think uh, he has created a belief among other rebel leaders that Khartoum can be rich and regime can be changed. Uh, I think he is really a grave uh, miss for uh, most people of Darfur, and I believe they can uh, gather together again and they will fight for the cause of Darfur until the matter will be resolved peacefully uh, in the Sudan. Well, I'd just like to go back to uh, Rabi Abdul Ati in Khartoum once again. You mentioned earlier that a number of groups have signed that peace agreement, that it is now possible, in your view, to begin to implement this effectively. Uh, but some observers maintain that that umbrella group, the Liberation and Justice Movement, is not truly representative of those on the ground within the troubled region of Darfur. What's your response to that particular criticism? Yes, uh, I, I am sure that now 90 or more than 90 percent of uh, Darfurians now they are supporting the peace and supporting the document that signed in Doha. And uh, also Darfurians now they are governing all states of Darfur without involvement of the f federal uh, government. And uh, I think now, now the rebels uh, and the uh, numbers of rebels now not uh, signing the uh, document of peace, they are now uh, against the people of Darfur now, and not against the federal government. But I think that now the trend in Darfur, the trend of people of Darfur is to implement peace and to live security, and they are now against any uh, uh, people and uh, groups that holding arms. This is what is on the ground and I don't think that there is any future which uh, can be seen for the repels to uh, actually to, uh, to, to, to actualize or to achieve any uh, success in future after the death of Khalil Ibrahim. Well, Hafiz Mohammed, uh, let's just try and clarify things here. You have essentially two uh, umbrella movements, one of which is signed the peace agreement and is attempting to implement it, and another of which, of which the um, JM was a, a founding member, is one that remains opposed to that particular peace agreement. Now, is there any way that these two umbrella groups can form a united basis in terms of seeking a way forward? I, I think the problem of Sudan is a political problem. I don't think it's just carrying arms is resolved. I think it needs uh, resolve, it needs will, political will to resolve it. It is a political problem. And I think the, re the failure of politics will lead to violence, which is carrying arms. I think uh, the, uh, the, the Code Alliance actually agenda is, uh, or they call revolutionary movement agenda, is, uh, is they, it's like a, a coalition of 
what they call marginalized to address the issue. But at the end of the day, I think it's a political problem. If we want to resolve it, we have to address political. I, I simply, uh, just violence will cause a lot of damage. There is a lot of collateral damage. People will suffer. I think what we need is a genuine political engagement for all the Sudanese, the government, as a, as, a Sudan, as a Sudanese, the movement is seriously engaged in addressing the underlying causes of the, the violence and resolve it. That is the issue. And, and, and creating alliance after alliance, movement after movement, I think that will just prolong the suffering and the war. And what we need is a political will, a political, a genuine political process to address the issues, which is the underlying issues, which is cause a problem in Sudan and move forward. Well, I think uh, the, until that happens, and then we will have a problem. What? Because we have signed agreement after an agreement, but, but the needed peace is not actually yet on the ground. That is a problem. Well, let's go to Ishak Meki with that particular point in London. Is this a political issue, do you believe? Absolutely, I do agree with Hafiz. Uh, the political will for them from the government is vital, uh, vital and is essential. I think uh, it's fair to say that the government of Sudan have given a good deal of power to people of Darfur and people of marginalized uh, in the new government being recently formed. But we are, what we don't agree or what we don't uh, sure is that do they really have the power to rule the country as uh, partners and our people from, uh, from, from the, within the country? And also the newly peace agreement signed by Dr. Dr. Tajani Sese. Also, the agreement has really good, uh, good, uh, good part of it. But the only issue remain, do, is the Sudan government remain sincere for, for this or uh, the tactical? Uh, we do, we're not sure. But the way now things are going, if uh, the government is uh, sincere and have got really will to, to sort matters in the way that they're acting at the moment, it may bring uh, people to think, to uh, sit down and negotiate. But uh, the political issue is always remain a matter. I do agree with Hafiz. Well, it's also a question of perception, uh, perhaps. The reasons why people like Khalil Ibrahim would not sign that peace document is mistrust of that government in Khartoum. Uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Abdul Ati, what is your response to that? Is the government sincere in its attempts to forge a lasting peace process? Yes, and uh, you know the government uh, uh, didn't design that uh, document of peace in Doha, but this is designed by the mediators, uh, Qatari uh, mediator and uh, UN, uh, in addition to African Union mediator. And uh, the government uh, didn't have any, uh, you know, uh, actually uh, rejection or uh, didn't exclude any subject uh, from that issues. Uh, raised by rebels and also didn't exclude any group and uh, the government was ready to negotiate each and everything with the rebels but uh, actually the rebels they didn't uh, accept the document uh, uh, especially uh, justice and equality movement and other uh, few groups uh, that is why I think uh, the government is ready to implement peace and is ready to negotiate and is ready to actually to accept any group uh, which is ready also to join the government. Uh, and as I told you that now uh, a, a, bread, a, a broad base uh, government formed uh, so as to address all challenges including the crisis in Darfur. And I think that now we have already uh, cut uh, a long distance to implement this uh, document and uh, all Darfurians people now are, are supporting this document to resolve uh, uh, this uh, uh, problem and to achieve last peace and uh, uh, also uh, 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 comprehensive justice in Darfur in terms of uh, distribution of wealth and also distribution of power. Well, Ishak Meki in London, um, Khalil Ibrahim played a major part in forming the Sudanese Revolutionary Fund, this an umbrella of a number of factions, all of whom are opposed to that Doha peace process. What impact will his death have on that umbrella body in its opposition to the uh, peace efforts as have been outlined in Doha? Yes, uh, well, I would say that uh, uh, the, the issue always remains that the Sudan government not sincere for all uh, peace agreements that so far signed, uh, starting from Minimi now, and there's many, many on, on, on that line. 
And I think if uh, the sincereness is there, then I don't see why the, the fighting in Blue Nile now and Kurdifan and, and, and settling down in Darfur, I think there's a uh, bit of contradictory here. But for, for the question you raised, that I think the um, death of Khalil Ibrahim is a tragic event, and uh, it does not really make those uh, groups that are working together to demoralize. I think uh, the, the Justice and Equality Movement, I believe uh, they will appoint a leader in the same caliber, with the same uh, views, the same uh, character, uh, to lead Justice and Equality Movement and to get together with the other two groups. And uh, Khalil Ibrahim has, uh, has a power in terms of uh, resources, of military resources, and uh, same as the rest of the group. So I think uh, there wouldn't be a very long time before the new appointment will come, come through, and uh, his death will not really uh, derail the ambitions of those three, uh, three groups together. I think they will, uh, they will lead the way again. And uh, my advice for the government of Sudan really to, to, uh, to sit down uh, with those uh, leaders to, to negotiate sincerely, to address their issues, uh, which is uh, more likely political, rather than saying, well, this uh, Darfur uh, file is being closed, Dr. Khalil is dead. Uh, there's many, many Darfurians out there still waiting in, the, in abroad, in, in Chad, in, uh, in neighboring countries. They do believe that the genuine grievance of Darfur hasn't been addressed completely yet, and the, uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the agreement that so far signed between Sudan government and the rest of the, the group did, did not show, it's not showing that uh, we are ending with the government who we can believe and trust. We actually missed uh, and lacking trust from the Sudan government. That's a big Well, let's just go back to, uh, let's step. go back to Rabi Abdul Ati at that particular point who had been trying to interject just before that. Uh, you had a point about the composition of those opposed to this peace process, did you not? You know, this opposition under this umbrella of revolutionary front against our government is just a name. Because, uh, you know, Malik Agar, who was uh, the governor of Blue Nile, now driven from the Blue Nile, and no even a single uh, you know, soldier from SPLM, uh, what's so called the uh, sector of the north in Blue Nile. And uh, Abdelaziz Al Hulu, who was also the uh, deputy of uh, uh, Sasser Kurdufan, uh, state also driven to the mountains uh, which is uh, uh, between the north and the south and uh, this also he has no effect uh, in uh, Sasser and Kurdufan and Khalil Ibrahim now died also killed in this uh, attack in northern Kurdufan they actually those uh, you know uh, three yani, uh, actually uh, pillars of the revolutionary uh, front they, they, they don't have common grounds uh, different objectives and different also uh, methods and uh, I don't think that uh, there is any future for them to actually to achieve any of their targets or any of their objectives uh, and now there is nothing called revolutionary front on the ground either in uh, Blue Nile or in uh, Southern Kurdufan or in Northern uh, Well at uh, this Darfur. point let's, let's that very is why quickly I don't if think I may. That this if I, if I very quickly, if I may go to Hafiz Mohammed, also in, in Khartoum, with a very brief final question. As a summation, does the killing of Khalil Ibrahim help or hinder the peace process, in your view? I, I, think, I think it might have some significance in the short run. But uh, in the long run, I think what we need is to address the underlying causes of the problems. I don't think it's personalities, because at the end, we all die. But, but the problems will stay. I think genuineness in addressing the underlying causes of the problems, Khartoum and Preferis, that will resolve the problem and end rebellion. I think that's what we need. It's not just uh, one person or another. I don't think that, uh, in, in the long run, represent a significant factor. Well, at that, so. that point, I'd like to thank our guests, Hafiz Mohammed, Ishag Meki, and Rabi Abdul Ati. And thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to send us your feedback, just email your thoughts to us at InsideStory at aljazeera.net. I'm Mike Hanna. Thanks for watching.